Hi, everybody. I made a new intro because I got a new phone and I couldn't edit my old intro that I made anymore. So I had no choice. So hopefully you guys like that one. No more beachy music. I spent like an hour listening to songs to try and figure out the right one to put with it. So hopefully that one is okay. So Rod is away. He is taking a break. He, I think he's on vacation. I think he went somewhere. I don't know where he went though, but George, my good friend, the antique nomad is filling in for him as co-host for me tonight. And below me are Sam and Adam from Jolie Flips. They are here in Florida. Like myself, I've went shopping with them quite a few times. So you might've seen them in my catch treasure hunting videos. And then Caddy corner is Matt Greg from antiquing with Matt Greg. I put everybody's channel links in the description for you guys. Neither one of them have been on before, so I'm going to let both of them introduce themselves, and then we will get to your questions. Get your questions in early. Yes, George is here. George, George, George. Yeah. All right. <laughs> oh, I'll let, actually, I'm going to let George introduce himself, too, since George isn't here all the time, too. So first, we will see Sam and Adam. Hi, I am Samantha. This is Adam. We're with Jolie Flips Vintage. We are actually not resellers full-time technically. I'm a full-time RN and Adam is a full-time stock trader. We both work at home so we just kind of make reselling work for us. Um, it's starting to become full-time so that's uh, why we started our YouTube channel um, just to show people how you can do that on uh, on the side even when you're working full-time and oh yeah we, we could tell you we could write a whole book about our lives but um but yeah that's us we're here in south florida we have two locations boca raton and fort lauderdale beach and that's it do you want to say anything you covered it all you did great <laughs> perfect <laughs> here's matt hey um so i've been a full-time antique dealer since graduating college in 2004 and uh currently i'm driving around with my girlfriend we do one to four month long stays places and i drive a van full of stuff and i ship as i go Perfect. That's a lot like George. Speaking of, okay, here's George. Hey there. Yes. Uh, well, I do something sort of similar to that. I'm a little more seasonal. I'm in uh, Florida in the winter and the Midwest in the spring and the fall and out West in the summer. And I also have been in the reselling business actually for quite a while now. I 35 years this year. Uh, so it gets under your skin and then you just can't really get out of it. So, uh, <laughs> It's it's just great. I love it. And um, it's so much fun. I, I do a lot of real world events as well as selling online. So um, yeah, I, I've gotten to meet everyone except Matt in person. And it's it's just so much fun. Just love this community. Yeah, we were and I saw a question. George is in Ohio right now. I saw somebody ask that he, he is there right now currently. Mm -hmm. Matt and Matt, Matt, you're in Ohio too right now. Yes. Yeah. So they're both in Ohio right now. And yeah, Sam we're not and Adam. Too far actually. Yeah. Do you go to the Springfield? I think that's why everybody's there, right, George? What is yeah. everybody there for? Springfield? Well, no, I'm actually uh, just here. I'm taking a vacation from a vacation and I'm meeting with <laughs> Uh, Jocelyn from Crazy Lamp Lady, and she's got some business here, and uh, so I'm just hanging out for a couple of days. Oh, that works. All right. So Teresa has the first question, and I don't know if any of us on the panel can help. So if you guys in the audience can help her, she said she's having issues when she's listing, and she enters a SKU and a price on eBay. It disappears and she can't see it but when she previews the listing the price is there so she's asking if anyone else and i'm wondering so i'm actually thinking about this we talked about this backstage a little bit um on your listing page like on a phone oh george has got george is like a magic trick and not <laughs> whoa hold on sorry musical people um all right know what happened there <laughs> on your phone, you can't see the SKU unless you hit revise listing if you're looking at it. I bet that's what she's talking about. So you actually have to hit revise to see the SKU on your app on your phone unless it sells. And if it sells, it shows you the SKU and the sold. So I bet if anybody in the chat, like, 
I think Sam and Adam, you guys, what were you saying as far as like the chat and stuff? Yeah, we just haven't had that experience. So I was thinking, you know, every time I have a question, something like that, I call eBay. I, I just get them. They're so good. Their customer service is great. I know it's a little tricky getting a hold of them the, these days. They don't have a direct number anymore, but, um, you know, you just request them to call you back and just ask them. And I'm sure they'll have a quick answer for you. Perfect. Matt, have you had that happen at all? So, yeah, so people are saying from the phone. Have you had that issue? You sell on eBay too, right, Matt? Yeah, um, I have not had that issue. So it, are they using like um, listing like multiple items of the same price? You know, I, I don't, I use everything <laughs> I list is just one of a kind. So I don't, I don't do multiples or anything like that. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, th I think it's a phone thing. Like, unless you edit, revise it, I don't think you can see it is what's going on. Yeah, uh, I don't sell a lot that has a skew, but um, the fact that you said you could preview it and see that it was there. I mean, I find with eBay, it just makes sense to preview all your listings anyway. So if it's coming up in your preview and it's there, I, I maybe just don't worry about it. All right. And some people are saying it's a known issue since a recent update. So maybe they know about it and they're working to fix it, hopefully. Miss Rachel says at the beginning, did you have support from your friends and family or did they think you were nuts for doing what you do? Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I thought people would think I was nuts because it's just another venture that I get into and I, I, when I get into something, I go all in <laughs> like my obsession with Elvis. Everyone's like, she's going to love Elvis for two minutes and then not. But I have an obsession with vintage and I had everyone's full support, surprisingly. And even so, like my dad has allowed us to use his beach condo to literally transform this whole condo into a stage for selling on whatnot, knickknacks. Uh, you know, when I stage items, when I take pictures, I have strategic places in the home that I could take photos. So that is, <laughs> to me, that's like full on support. So actually, I think that's why we're successful at it is because people support and friends buy from us, you know. So, yeah, I would say I got full support. We absolutely, got full support. Yeah. yeah. How about so, you? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Well, I know we went over that beforehand. I sorry about that. Yeah, so I started as like uh, owning an antique shop and owning a booth in an antique shop and doing shows. And I will say that um, my experience with like family supporting people doing this is that most show dealers kind of grew up in the business, and that includes myself. My uh, my parents, my mom was a dealer as well. So a lot of the people I know in the business who do a lot of the uh, more like nationally known shows most of them probably grew up in the business. So we, we all kind of, which is, a, I think, a different experience than like a lot of like modern resellers who are probably watching now who are getting into this as like a side hustle first. And so they maybe don't grow up in the business. And I could see where maybe some of their friends think they're crazy and some don't. But I did have family support. When I started out, I'd been in the business running antique malls and doing the marketing and running a chain of them. And when I decided to go off on my own, that's when people decided I was crazy because I left a job that paid well and I was managing 65 people and I had a sure paycheck every month. And all of a sudden I'm like, no, I want to be on the other side doing what the dealers do because that looks like fun. And that's the part I haven't done yet. Uh, my mom, after I had done it a while and she could see I was going to be a success, said, oh, I'm so glad it worked out because I was afraid that you were just going to turn into a bum and live in your car for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> but she didn't say it. She just thought it. And I proved them all wrong. So, uh, no, I've had pretty great support, actually, all the way along. I think, I think most people are <laughs> fearful of stepping out on their own. And so I think usually if you do, you get mad props and, and people wish you success because most people think about doing things like this and they never actually do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, <clears throat> I've been coughing. That's why I keep hiding. Um, I've been reselling off and on my whole life and my, 
family, I think, has been used to me doing crazy stuff. Like Sam saying she goes all in, like her Elvis thing. That is me with almost anything I do. Like my resin, if you guys watched that, I like went full steam ahead. Um, right now, I don't really have, I'm, I'm full steam ahead with YouTube again. I go off and on with that. Right now, I'm putting out videos every day between my two channels. So I'm full steam ahead on that again. And I think they just shake my head and know that like when I do it, I go all in and I've been doing it off and on since 99. So for a long time, this time my mom didn't really say anything, but my mom's been working for me before I quit nursing. So I was paying her. So I don't think she could not support me because I'm, I'm who pays her paycheck. But um I think like, like George was saying, I think like the other nurses and I hear from some of them, they wish me support because they wish they could do it because it takes a lot of courage to just step outside of close to a six figure income and say, I'm going to support myself and I will figure it out, which is what I've done. So my, I think everybody just shakes their head at me. They support me, but they're like, yeah. And my husband has said that he has long ago stopped questioning me because I'm just like, go, I will figure it out. I'm just go, go, go. I will make it work. And if I have to switch it up, I switch it up. You guys hear me say pivot all the time. I think that's an important thing. But I would say if you don't have family and friends support, there's a great community here that will support you. So don't let negativity from them, if it's what you want to do, stop you from doing it. Because I hear from a lot, I actually have husbands come and comment on my videos that they think their wives are crazy and think they can do this and like how ridiculous is this. And there, there's great community support here. So if you're not getting it from your friends and family, find find some new friends, guys. Find some new <laughs> friends. They are out there. You know, I, it's hard when you don't have support and, you know, hearing negativity to keep being positive because it's a hard road, especially full time. Like you're, you know, it's it's a legit full time job. All right. Liz sent 1999 Super Chat and said, George, heading to an estate sale in my home state of Mississippi, an old plantation home that hasn't been touched for years. I resell Pyrex and Fire King, but the sale goes much further back. What would you look for in an estate like that? Well, I think everyone should answer this question because we all probably would look for uh, different stuff. But I, I went to one plantation sale in Macon, Georgia, and the thing that really struck me is that the things that were priced really cheap were the 20th century stuff. Everybody went for this antebellum home and the Victorian furniture was priced really high and the art was priced really high and the sculpture was priced really high and the Budweiser sign that I sold for $165 was five bucks. So look for the thing that doesn't seem like it should be there, especially if it's really crowded. Also, you know, when you step in, you'll get a feel really quickly for how they're pricing things. And, you know, if a place has been shut for a long time, um, you know, sometimes there's really interesting things that, uh, you know, take a chance on a few things. If you see something you've never seen before, if it's uh, something that's some crazy Victorian piece that just looks interesting, uh, it seems like there's starting to be some interest in Victoriana again. So, uh, you know, don't be afraid to look at the old stuff, too. Uh, and just, you know, check condition and, and look at prices and, you know, just just take your time and have fun. It sounds like a great sale. All right, Sam and Adam, what would and we'll let Matt answer as well. So what would you be looking for? So I, I agree with George, like the the antique stuff, like a lot of that is coming back like I'm selling Dresden again. Like, that's crazy. But what I look for myself, well, we're really big on MCM. So if I go into an estate sale, my eyes are darting all over the place for atomic clocks. Um, I'm looking for atomic anything. Um, Eames, I found an Eames chair for like $14 one time. I mean, that is where, that's what our business is mostly mid-century. But we're starting to sell antiques that I thought I was going to have to give up to Goodwill soon. But they're actually selling. So 
yeah, just look for anything unusual. That's something I actually learned from Crazy Lamp Lady because I watch her quite a bit. And she, her eyes go straight to, um, you know, things that are unusual. So if it looks unusual and, uh, you know, interesting to you, most likely it's interesting to someone else. Um, so, yeah, so that's, I don't know, we just look for anything that I think looks good. <laughs> but you got to have your Google Lens ready, right, to see what's selling. <laughs> and what they're selling for too. So I spend a long time in an estate sale. I'll be there right when they open. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. That's what we look for. So, so I agree. I think sometimes your best bet is to look for the stuff that seems a little bit different than the bulk of it. That can be oftentimes priced, uh, you know, cheap enough. I will say that like, even if you're at an auction, for instance, like sometimes the the cheapest thing or the worst thing there has the most money left in it because everyone's going after the best stuff. Um, for me, though, if I was headed to this estate sale, I would look for similar stuff to what I always look for, which is like old carvings, folk art. Um, Southern pottery is very desirable, but you have to kind of know what you're looking at in regards to that. And uh, Southern furniture is often great, too. And that's Again, that's one of those things that if you don't know what you're looking at, it's impossible to tell. But early selling furniture, you'd have to know the wood and the forms to tell what, what is what. But that's what I would be looking for. Can, can I just add something? Um, Kat, do you, do you guys get this question a lot? People ask a lot, like, but how did you know to pick that up, right? But how, how would you it, know that? And that's like I think when he talks about this, like, yeah. Jocelyn, look, it's a great <laughs> lady, everybody. Hi. With George. Hi. <laughs> hi, hi. <laughs> um, I I think that I I hear that a lot, and I think we all do because I think people want just like an easy way to know what to pick up, and there's no easy way, guys. It's time. It's learning. It's watching all of these channels like watching what they're picking up, what they're selling and it takes time and it takes years and you are constantly learning what to pick up. And like, how do you know, because you've either sold it before you saw it on George's channel or maybe Matt or Sam and saw that they said that this is, I am horrible with styles and trends. Do not, do not follow me. So I think <laughs> LaDonna saying, trust your gut. Your gut is something that develops with experience, right? Everybody here has been doing it for years, but if you're new, you don't know. And it's just pick up. My advice is pick everything up and, and touch it and look it up, look it up. It, you know, there's Google lens, which is a beautiful thing now. Um, and look it up. If it was a me and this is me at any estate sale, you guys know, I love linens. I love bench. I just listed a bunch of really valuable nightgowns and robes that I picked up from an estate last week. Um, pillows, I think get overlooked a lot. Um, I, I, it's, it's the lint. I, I love vintage linen and most times they're not expensive at estate sales. That's what I really like. I can pick them up for a dollar or two. And sometimes like some of the robes I just listed are like 50, 60, $70 and I paid a dollar for them. So that's what <laughs> I, I would be, I would be hitting the linen. I'm going to give, I'm going to give Liz a whale, the whale. I like the whale. There you go. And Liz is a nurse too. She said in the chat, there are a lot of nurses in the reselling space. I've learned throughout my years, a lot, a lot of them. Thank you for Thank all that you do. Yes, yes. Yeah, and she's in the ER. The ER is probably Ooh. what broke me and was the final straw for me as far <laughs> as saying I'm done. Um, the ER was definitely at the top of that list because I was a float nurse, so I worked everywhere. And yeah. All right. Shirley is asking if an item is vintage, do you lead with vintage and then the brand or do you always list the brand first? Um, it depends. Oh, that's a good question. It really depends on how hot that brand is at the moment. 
So I do a lot of spending time on social media. I'm on whatnot a lot. I'm on knickknacks a lot, trying to see what people are buying. If the, and Adam watches CNBC all the time, so he knows what's hot at the moment. So if a brand is hot at the moment, we talk about this. A lot. I will yeah. put, yeah, I will put the name of it first in capital letters on my listing. Um, like if it's an Eames chair, going back to Eames, I'll put Eames chair. If it's something that is hot at the moment, like brooches, right? Like this brooch, I don't know what brand that is. So I'll put, you know, vintage enamel brooch. So it really depends on how desirable the brand name is at the moment and how desirable an item is at the moment. Whatever it is, you're going to put that at the forefront of your listing. Was so, that, is that a good answer? <laughs> yeah, I, I think you would put the most important searchable word first. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess you, you do want the title to make a little bit of sense if it's being read, but it's also, it's all indexed and searchable. So the most important word should go first, whether, you know, that's the brand or the specific type of item. I, I doubt, I mean, I do lead a lot of my listings with antique first, just because it, it reads better as a sentence to me, but I would think in this case, you would probably put, you know, vintage is, is kind of one of those words that we all use, but can be a throwaway word. So you might want to go with the object or the brand name first. Yeah, I've learned to put the word vintage in the listings because Kat taught me that. I was always using the old appraisal term circa, and a lot of people don't realize what that means. So vintage is definitely an important word, and that has helped my sales, Kat. Thank you. Uh, but I, I agree. Start with a noun, either what the thing is, if the brand isn't the important part, or what the brand is, and then describe it. Vintage is a descriptor, so that to me should come later in the listing, but it should be there. Yeah, so this is a funny question that we get this because just in the last week, I have changed how I'm doing this. So I was one that vintage was the first word on 90% of my listings. And somebody, I don't remember if it was in one of these Tuesday night chats or my member chats, said that the first four words are the most important and vintage is probably overused and I think most of us probably know that. So now I, and it's habit, so I have to remember and I'll go back and edit almost every title. Vintage, like George was saying now, is coming either in the middle or at the very end of my titles versus at the beginning like it was and so i guess they're from what they were saying the first four words are the most searchable like as far as the results in the search terms so that's where like brand color what it is if it's a vase or whatever it is should be in those first four words and if you put vintage blue blah 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 and like the word vase comes way at the end. I'm hoping that switching the terms up will help. But remember too, your item specifics are searchable. So even if you can't fit something in there, like the color or vintage, if you pick it in the item descriptors or the specifics, it will still come up in a search. So I've, I've just started changing it. I'll have to let you guys know if I see any uptick in sales from that because I've, I've just I've just changed it the last week. I wonder if when people abbreviate vintage, I see that a lot on eBay, like VTG, like does, does I the I think if they like pick it? it in the specific, that it still would come up. But I bet that eBay knows, like I feel like that and like MCM for mid-century modern, I feel like it still comes up. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. Now, George has got me worried because I abbreviate Circa sometimes. So if they don't know what Circa means, I'm guessing they don't know the abbreviation of CA uh, yeah. 1900. <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what I found. <laughs> yeah, I take it completely out and just put the time because I don't think anybody's searching for Circa. Um, you know what I mean? Like if I need the, I'll put it in, but if I need the characters for like, you know, a color or a descriptor, I'll take out the Circa out of my title. Cause I don't think anybody 
searching for it. And I mean, you guys in the chat can tell us maybe I'm wrong. Maybe people do search for it, but I don't know. All right. Noni said, if you have something in the original box with styrofoam, do you take any other precautions or do you ship it like that? Oh, that actually. That's a good question. Yeah, it's yeah. a good question because actually we ran into a, I'm like one of those packers that I'm like really neurotic. I don't want anything to break. Nothing's ever broken yet that I know of. And I have had to take out a, um, a ceramic. It was a Mary Englebright piece and it was in its original box with styrofoam. But when I shook the box, it's just like all over the place. So I did take it out and I wrapped it thinly with the bubble wrap and I put it back in the styrofoam, but it was good enough where it wasn't moving around. And so, yeah, I do alter to, to make sure you get it, you know, um, intact. I you need to be careful too. If the box itself is collectible, obviously you want to oh, yeah, uh, then I would. Re repack that in an outer box. Um, yeah. I don't sell a lot of stuff that would be like in the original box. It doesn't apply much to me, but yeah, I think uh, even if it's a cardboard box that says like Texaco on it, because it had like a Texaco toy hat in it, you would want to pack that into another box to protect the original box. Yeah, yeah, if the box never been open, I, I won't open the box. Yeah, I've, I've sold Legos and I've just wrapped them up really like the original box. People, that's very important to a lot of people. Don't want anything shaking, rattling yeah. around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And the other thing, too, is that, um, you know, think about how it was shipped initially. Sometimes we're seeing a piece that's in a box with styrofoam and it looks perfectly great to us. But if it was part of a lot of 12, it may have been in another bigger box. So maybe that box isn't really meant for shipping. So use a little bit of common sense there. Yeah. And it, with vintage stuff, some of that styrofoam can degrade too. I've seen where I don't feel like it's as cushiony and I know styrofoam, but it, you know, it kind of flakes and I feel like dries out somewhat. Um, for me, if it's like a newer item and the styrofoam still in good condition, I would put it in another box, but I wouldn't really worry about like bubble wrapping it. But if it's older, then I'm going to bubble wrap it inside of another box. But we've had like some newer Disney figurines, you know, like 10, 15 years old and the styrofoam still in excellent condition. So we'll just put them inside another box and ship them off. Never in that box. Like I would never slap a label on that and ship it out and do it that way. But if and also the money, guys, think of the money. If it's something really valuable, I'm going to wrap it up like Fort Knox and bubble wrap. Mm -hmm. In the, even if it's a stuffed animal <laughs> like so think think of your values too urban antiques and unique sent a ten dollar super chat super chat and said here's a coffee on the house for you guys thank you for sharing advice you are very welcome here is a dolphin super chat. the original that the the old dolphin all right Lee said, I am new to whatnot. I have bought some items to sell, but the seller hasn't sent an invoice and I can't remember what I paid. Is there somewhere I can go to find that info? Yeah, I think you can go into your your orders, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, there should be, if you're doing it on your phone, there's like a top in the app on the top right, there's like three lines, so you click on that and you go down to orders, click on orders and just look at all your options there. I think it's there. I, I buy a lot. Of oh, it that. says purchases. Pur purchases, purchases, yes. And oh, then yeah. it will tell you the amount. And I am one of the sellers, I do not send invoices. Like we were selling 500 items a week. The, the amount of paper that would be is yeah. just too much, but they also email you an invoice. Um, what not does for every purchase, but it goes, let me see. I'll tell you how far it goes back. It go. it looks like it goes back. Oh, well over a year on here. Like this one I bought in March of 23 and it's still there. And does it tell me how much? Oh, so on the list, it tells me how much I paid. So yeah, if you go to your purchases, it should give you that whole history. 
Oh, this is a good, this, this sometimes is, is one you'll get different answers from us. Faith wants to know, do you put immediate payment required when you list an item? I do now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's my answer. I do now. I just, I just don't like this whole business. I was just telling you about how I really wish eBay wouldn't give people the option to pay later. You know, it's just sometimes they don't at all. And trying to like communicate with them is just something extra for me to have to think about. And, uh, yeah, I do now. I, I I've said had to cancel too. orders uh, yeah. because they don't send the payment. So it's like you get so excited that you sold your item and then it doesn't get them. Yeah. You know, they don't pay for it. But yeah, I do uh, require immediate payment on that. I don't. Um, I haven't had a huge problem with that, but I also started selling when people would mail you a check. So. Uh, I don't know. It, it's so much faster now. Yeah. Hidden cash in an envelope. That was a strange thing. Um, and money orders. But yeah, I, I don't, but I've thought about it. So the right answer probably is you should, and I, but I don't. Yeah. Um, I am seriously considering it. The problem is, is that a, a fair number of my sales go to people who are viewers and I know them and I know when they can pay and they usually make it good within a few days. And, all of that is fine, but I've actually had three months in a row where I sold an expensive item and eBay let somebody with practically no feedback bid it up at the last minute and none of them paid. And the thing that I get, think gets me is I would like to at least have the control of saying if your feedback is under 100, you have to pay immediately because you're not proven as a customer yet. Um, that would cut out the problem I've been having, but I, I don't, I'm not aware of that being an option. Yeah, I don't think you can set a criteria. I do not require immediate payment. And one of the biggest reasons is people can't combine items. If you require immediate payment, they'll have to pay the shipping on each item. And eBay has instituted those. Some people are required when they submit offers to put their card information in. So some of them will... Um, have to pay anyways those i just refund but i don't turn it on i'm okay waiting a day or two i very very rarely have people that are non-paying so i i haven't really um i haven't really had an issue with people not paying so i don't i don't plan on turning it on if ebay turn it seems like it's the offers that don't pay not the people that just buy it you know, the people that buy it typically pay right away without requiring immediate payment, in my experience. Oh, I saw another super chat. Where did it go? Here it is. Don sent a dollar ninety-nine super chat. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Here it goes. Dun, 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 dun. All right. If a buyer sends you an offer and you made a counter offer and they didn't accept it, can you go back and accept their offer? Um, I don't think so. I think you can chat with them and have a conversation about it. Um, I think that happened to me one time with and I'm poly vase, but they like kind of like lowballed me and I still sold it anyway. I went, I went back and said, okay, you know, if you want it, okay. But yeah, I had to message them. I think that's the only option, right? You, you have to, and then fix the whole listing again. I don't remember. I had to do a bunch of stuff. I definitely that. went back and forth. Yeah, it went back and forth. Nah. Yeah, I think once you make the counter offer, you've turned down the first offer. So, and then you have limited amount of offers you can send, you know, via messenger. So you might have to go in, you could message them and tell them you would take it, but you might actually have to lower the price in the listing for that to work. Yeah. That's and then it. someone else could conceivably buy it. Yep. What they said. Yeah. They hit the nail on the head. There's no way. Cause in order to counter that's you declining that offer. So you could message them and, say hey i'm willing to take it now i wouldn't eat face and do that i would just let it be um personally you know i'd be like yeah it's okay um but i'm sure like 
there, I know on Poshmark and Mercari, it'll tell you, you can send the buyer their last offer, which is nice. Like if you counter, they decline, it'll say match buyer's last offer. But on eBay, I don't think there's an option to do that. This is very, very opinion based. Miss Mary said, should I put a variety on my eBay store or concentrate on a large quantity? quantity of vintage specialty fabric and trim. I'm going to assume by this question that she has a large quantity of vintage and specialty fabric already. I'm hoping that I'm answering this right. Um, so it started off where I had one thing in mind when I started the business. Like I wanted all only mid-century modern, but I thrift a lot and I thrift for profit on YouTube and I'm finding things that I like that's modern or antique from different times. So I can't really I just say it's like curated by us, but it modern pieces. So now it's just whatever I, I put up. It could even be like a pottery barn lunchbox, <laughs> you know, and, but of course, like our last, the word on our business is vintage. So we mainly stick with vintage items, but like, Hey, if there's money to be made somewhere, whether it's a lunchbox or a lamp or something, I'm going to do it. So that's us though. You, you can curate, you know, do your own thing. So I'm primarily antique objects, but on eBay, I'm all over the place because I will have like comic books or baseball cards or something more along the lines of collectibles. I have found that that works for me on eBay. I will say I sell the prime, my primary way of selling stuff is actually social media and my social media is more curated. I don't mix the comics and newer stuff with the uh, period antiques or the early folk art. Yeah, that's interesting. I think it's really up to the, it's how you want to develop your market. If you want to be known as a specialist and really hone in on one thing and develop a regular customer who comes back or puts in a standing order with eBay every time you list such and such, well, then that's a way to develop a market. Um, but I sell anything. I mean, I sell primarily antique and vintage, but I'll put anything on because I figure, you know, it's a huge market that could reach all sorts of people. And I have not seen uh, my repeat customers usually come from the social media, just like uh, uh, just like you said, and not from um, eBay, just randomly finding me and then coming back to me. But, um, you know, I really think it just depends what kind of a dealer you want to be and what makes it easier for you. I have a friend who does nothing but vintage fabric and she does very well, but she's decided that's all she's going to do. And so people come back to her because they know that's what they're getting. Yeah, and I saw you put, you had 5,000 yards. So if you have it, then I would list it. But if you have other stuff, personally, I would list it too. And I know Rod always refers to like, if somebody's searching for a camera, they would prefer a camera shop. Same thing's true, like, like George was saying with the fabric. So if you have a regular person that buys a lot of fabric, if they know you have it, they're gonna go look, but I feel like they're gonna look whether you have other stuff or not. And a good example, I just bought, Oh my gosh, I don't know how much vintage lace, like totes and totes. And one lady has bought probably 80% of what I've sold. And I have 7,000 listings with tons of other stuff, but she keeps coming back and she just buys the lace. So they could search in your store just for the fabric. I wouldn't go shopping for other stuff. If you don't have other stuff and you have all the fabric, I would list the fabric because you already have it. So you wouldn't have to spend any money going out shopping and we do we do pretty well with vintage fabric as well i have to put this up here um ray said he has a thing for turvis cups too if you watch my cat's treasure hunting or <laughs> my thrifting videos i have like this crazy obsession with turvis and i i think there's like some on the counter yes you do <laughs> and i they could like they're not worth very much and i can't like i can't not buy them and i don't know why but i just found a romero brito which i love romero brito i sold a three thousand dollar painting of his last year um and that was the first time i found a romero brito turvis and I listed it. It is up in my store. I was, <coughs> I was on the fence. I wanted to keep it. <coughs> I'm 
I'm going to try not to choke myself here. Um, <laughs> BJB is asking, what trends are you seeing in vintage fashion? Oh, um, uh, uh, let's see. I sell um, at vintage markets also in the Palm Beach area, and I tend to be selling a lot of eel skin. I know that sounds weird, but like vintage eel skin bags, um, faux fur is coming back here in South Florida. That old Florida look, the Michelle Pfeiffer and Scarface look. <laughs> um, so I'm looking over at my rack of vintage clothes here. Um, flannel is still really relevant and things with, um, what's that pattern? That it, Pendleton? What is it called again? Pendleton? Yeah, am I saying it right? Yeah. yeah. Pendleton. That's what I see. I don't sell a whole lot of clothes, but I'm, I'm dabbling now. I'm getting into it. And so broken. I don't. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, sorry Matt. Okay. Um, so I don't sell vintage clothing, but I will say the one thing I've noticed is that as a person who's been going to Brimfield since the uh, early nineties and Brimfield is a, like a week long flea market, a town full of 21 different flea markets for a week in Massachusetts. Uh, the number of vintage clothing dealers has exploded. And I just did, um, one of the antique shows in Nashville for Nashville Antiques Weeks, and they have added a vintage clothing show. So vintage clothing just seems to be incredibly hot. It's probably one of those things that I wish I had learned about 10 years ago. Well, you might not have wanted to know it 10 years ago. I think you're right that it's hotter now. Um, what I'm seeing is, uh, funnily enough, all of those really sparkly sequin tops from the 80s and early 90s that were worn by older women are being worn by younger women. And I find that interesting. And I saw that in Nashville at a vintage uh, clothing store that I went to. And I'm seeing it in all of the vintage clothing stores now. It seems like that's something people are really focused on. Um, I think 80s era in general is really good. Uh, I, the older vintage clothing is really cute, but we are in an era where there are not that many people who are small enough to wear that. You know, you get back to 50s and stuff and you have people with 17 inch waists and I don't see very many people with 17 inch waists these days. Um, so uh, the <laughs> my experience over the years, I don't deal with it a lot, but I, I see pieces and I get it if I like it. I do better with accessories. I really stick to coats are good because a coat can fit a number of different people depending on what you wear underneath of it. Um, I, I do well with purses, jewelry, um, certain hats even will sell. Um, but um, for me, the sizing is the problem. So the vintage clothing that I see selling is actually more recent vintage, 80s era. Um, 90s is a little tough because the early 90s were kind of anti-fashion. It was grungy. And so uh, flannel is good. Pendleton is good, in, especially in the Northwest where I'm from, because uh, it's made up there. And that's the stuff that we were all wearing when that all became popular the first time. Um, but, um, you know, I don't know. I would say I would say look for 80s era uh, right now seems to be kind of the sweet spot. I, I said it earlier, like I'm horrible at trends and knowing like what's in style because I have no sense of style and I'm not very fashionable. But um, I one of my videos this week, if you guys want to keep an eye out, I actually am researching boho as a keyword. And there is a lot of clothing in that. And there is clothing that's selling for hundreds of dollars. So watch for that. And I'm doing it to research and learn for myself, too, because I really don't know like the fashion stuff. So I'm doing boho. I'm going to do one on kitsch too, because I want to learn more myself. So I'm going to share it with everybody. And I'm do it's, it's gonna not just be clothes, but also like furniture and things that are selling with those keywords for high money. Um, yes, I saw Y2K in a lot of the boho listings as a keyword as well. Um, and I just I have no clue what is going on with fashion. I just I don't. I, I can't. I just. Well, one thing, too, of course, is designer. If it's a designer name from any era and it's in good condition, it's probably going to sell. Yeah. We were in New York City and we saw somebody walking down the street with what I thought was a trash bag. And come to find out, I think Balenciaga has a huge bag that looks literally like a trash bag. And I thought, well, what's stopping someone from just 
using a hefty bag. <laughs> I think I've seen time. that, and it's like super expensive too. Yeah. It's like yeah. <laughs> It's crazy. Miss Linda said my storage system for listed items is each item is given a number and all the numbers are in one bin. So it's not great because dissimilar items are in the same bin. So like she might have a DVD, a t-shirt, a dress, a mop head, a shelf or a puzzle camera. She wants to know what is your system for storing items? We don't well, have what one. System? We do the same thing. Do you see what's behind us? I had to go to Ikea and buy Billy bookcases to put stuff there that I, I just recently bought. But I think I do the same thing you did. You do. I have um, Target bins and I just number things uh, that's in there and I create like an inventory and I put the paper inside the bins and then when I sell something I just take the papers out and find out where I put it I just don't have I've got storage also I just I thrift and I'm I call myself a maximalist not a hoarder um <laughs> but I do have a lot of things and not because I don't sell I, I just don't have the time to organize uh, being a full-time nurse and I don't have the time to list as fast as I would like to but I think I have the same system you have so I only have about 150 items listed currently on eBay. And so for me, it's just because I'm traveling, I just have to find it. I do tend to have the stuff that's already listed in tubs together. Um, my biggest problem happens to be if I do a live in-person show or I sell it on Instagram, sometimes I forget to delete the eBay listing. Um, that's, that's usually my biggest problem and my biggest fear is to forget to remove the listing where it's sold somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes. I think it's so cute that they think we have a system. <laughs> <laughs> we should. <laughs> so for us, a lot of mine is exactly like what you said. But remember, I have 7,000 items listed. So I have to have it marked very good. So we have like a one, a two, some of them are bins, some of them are shelves, um, but they're all numbered. And we have three shed areas and a house. Now, my rental house is also storage for our business. Now, a lot of times with ours, because I buy in lots, like stuff will get put together. So like all of the laces in the same area, the clothes, if we have room on, we have racks, um, it is on the racks or we will fold it and number the shirts. Um, when I got a bunch of t-shirts, I did that, but we can find it. And I think the key is like, it doesn't matter. If you're not like overly OCD, this works perfect because you can find it. As long as you know the number, like all that matters is that you can find it. And I've shown my inventory and it looks like a hot mess, but if something sells, I can find it. And that's, to me, that's all that really matters. Like some of the stuff says on desk shelf or it like I have pictures hanging in the bathroom, hanging in Kat's bathroom. That's what the inventory SKU says. And so as long as we can find it, I have seen, and I will tell you he was on a uh, Johnny Cajun Roots reseller <clears throat> Is probably the most impressive system I've seen. It's not something I could ever do, but his inventory area looks like a Walmart. So like all of the games and toys are in this section and all of the housewares are in this section. And I just, that's not me. And we buy in such big lots that I might have an empty whole big section for a very long time until I buy more of whatever that is. So Ours just goes wherever. And if there's empty room in a bin, then it goes in that bin. If I really like it, it goes up on the desk or the display shelf here in the shed. Um, but the biggest thing is that you can find it. And I think as long as you're finding your stuff, I think your system is perfectly fine. And it's probably like almost everybody's, I would, I would guess. Just like two very obvious tips if you're using tubs. Um, don't put all of the heavy stuff in one area on top of stuff because it you hurt yourself. And then and don't put thing. it up high on a shelf. Yeah. yeah. I've had some stuff. I'm like, who put this stuff in this tote right. that's 
overhead high that I'm lifting down like, ah. And the I don't, I gave myself a black eye like that once. <laughs> and I did, <laughs> like something fell off. Luckily I had my glasses on or it probably would have <laughs> poked my eye out. Oh, and no. I think I was pulling inventory live for a video. It was a couple years ago and it like, clunk. Yeah. Oh, so no. be careful with that. Very careful. Um, Urban Antiques and Unique said, what is your advice for handling and selling glass items on eBay? In the past, I've been burned to the point I stepped away and was strictly only selling through carnival convention auctions. Okay, so this is an unintentional shout out, but worthy. I learned a lot from uh, my friends Slab Daddy US on um, uh, Whatnot Cat. Do you know them? They sell only glass on Whatnot. Um, these I people, do know who they are. Yeah, they are. I learned from them how to handle glass. That's all they sell. So it's a lot. So you have to factor in cost of a bubble of bubble wrap, right? So I don't like using bubble wrap. I am an environmentalist and I she like, wants to save the turtles. Yes, so. I want to save the turtles. Do not come to my house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I might steal your bubble boy bubble wrap if I come to your house. There is so much bubble. Don't buy. Well, if you bought stuff from me, then you see too. We yeah. overuse bubble wrap. I like bubble wrap personally. So. I just find that it's so expensive now. So I, I do sell glass. So I have bubble wraps strictly for glass. But you need, like, if you're selling in Polies or Viking or, you know, things like stuff like Swung Glass, um, I prefer bringing those to vintage markets so that people can just take it and put it in their car. But if I have to sell it, I'm going to use a lot of bubble wrap and I factor in the cost of that. Because it does cost a lot, right? Those bubble wrap expensive. expensive. Yeah. Not from Bubble Boy. No. You get four <laughs> rolls, four giant rolls for $40. Well, That's I'm gonna why I use it so specific. I'm going to listen to you and buy from them because yeah. you, you, you've been telling me to buy from them for a while. Four rolls. That's yeah. shit. And they do recycled, so that's a little Oh, good. Bit. Oh, yeah, they oh, do good. have recycled for you environmentally friendly people. <laughs> um, I will tell you, I tried it and the recycled's really slippery and I didn't like oh. it. It smells yeah. funny, that's too. I, I mean, I use plastic bags at grocery stores and stuff. I'm not like all like that. But it's just... It's just so costly. I'm thinking more of like the cost of bubble wrap. <laughs> I just says, I just say I'm an environment. Do they mean? Um, she says it, but she doesn't mean it. All right. I don't litter. What? In terms of like the item not breaking, or, or is that what you're? Yeah, I'm about? sorry. What is the concern? Okay. Um. um stepped away from me okay so yeah it, do you mean like you're afraid of breaking the item or not packing it right um is that what i don't know matt you give it a go i'm not but, i'm yeah i'm not sure specifically like what he burned out on it's exhausting. i mean if you're selling like five dollar glasses on ebay and then you're using a dollar's worth of material to wrap it and box it then it's it's not going to work but that's kind of true like we all have our points of where we think something's worth buying worth our time to resell uh, i i personally kind of want to make 40 or 50 dollars profit per object like and i so i sell a far fewer objects than other dealers and there's there's no right way to do this but you have to decide what like works for you and yes yeah, selling glass selling anything fragile you have to spend a fair bit of money on packaging and so yeah. you got to either pass that on to the customer somehow which either means the item has to be worth more or you have to charge a handling fee or do something. Just collect your glass. Just keep your glass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I noticed that the question, it's not entirely clear, clear from the question what he means as far as having been burned. And I think uh, I noticed that he said I was strictly selling only through carnival convention auctions. So I'm wondering, is it that you were sending things out and people were sending back reproductions and claiming you sold them a repro? Or is it that um, they were sending back things and claiming that they were damaged or maybe substituting something that was damaged and ordering your good one and sending it back? Um, there are a few tricks that I know some people who sell glass, if that's the problem, uh, you can use kind of like those marker detector things if you're very careful and don't put it somewhere where it will affect the finish, um, where you can actually shine a black light and make sure if something come back, comes back to you that it actually is the piece that you sent. 
Um, so if that's the problem you're having, that might be a suggestion too. I'm not entirely sure what, when you say you've been burned by selling on eBay, I'm not sure what aspect of it was, um, was not working. Yeah, and I overuse bubble wrap. I see all you popcorn people in the chat, and I will tell you I am anti-popcorn. I love my bubble yeah. wrap, but I hate packing peanuts. Um, and Jocelyn actually is the one who got me away from packing peanuts because she hates them too. And once I heard she was doing bubble wrap and paper, I was like, well, if the crazy lamp lady can send all this glass without packing peanuts, so can I. And ever since then, we only use peanuts if we receive peanuts. So I won't throw them away. I do recycle them and I will use them. And then I'm like, these people are going to hate me every time I put peanuts in a box because I do not like getting packing peanuts myself. Um, I have really slacked up on picking glass up because of the time and the cost packaging it. So for me, I'm not, not wanting as much as Matt but probably like $30 or higher profit. So probably a 40 to $50 item for me in order to do it. Um, and I haven't had any issues with anything breaking because I, I even got a negative feedback that I use too much bubble wrap. That's how much <laughs> bubble wrap I use. Um, and Marsha just put the link to Joel American Bubble Boy. Um, you get four giant rolls for 40 bucks free shipping. Like it's, it's really cheap. Um, so we use a lot and a lot of paper. So the reason I hate peanuts is because Dalton was like a baby when I started doing this and he would, he liked to shred them. So my whole floor would be nothing but like frayed styrofoam. And that's why I didn't I like it. Doing that. He, I, he I, still I, would. He still I, does. Yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> He, yeah, it's not just a baby thing. Annie <laughs> sent a five dollar super sticker, and then Miss Linda said, Thank you, your advice and candor is uplifting. You are very welcome. I'm going to give you Dalton on the beach here. He's so cute every time. <laughs> I have an updated one of him that I took at Clearwater Beach. I need to I need to make a new super chat for it. And I'll watch and see if we get an update. I didn't see anything else more specific about him, about like how he was burned. So we could maybe address that a little bit better. MC Hang says... Do you think it's better to show your listings with the eBay category or do you have your own store categories? The I, default I, is eBay, I will tell you. Yeah. The default is it just goes into eBay. I use the eBay categories. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, I've never changed that. I actually do both. I have a store category and an eBay category because I find that sometimes the eBay category, uh, what I do is I, I'll look and see if I have an item and I'll look at what the other uh, people, the people who got the top dollar, what they listed it in. And sometimes it really makes sense. And sometimes it just seems sort of random, like eBay sort of pigeons you into a thing and there isn't really a category that really describes it. So I actually have my own store categories too. Does it matter? The jury's out. I don't know. So I, and I, I told this a couple of weeks ago, when I first made my store, I started making store categories. And then I realized how much different stuff I buy. So I ended up reverting back to eBay categories because I just buy so much different stuff. I had like I mean, eBay's probably got thousands of categories. I was getting close to that and I was just like, forget it. So now I only, I just use the eBay categories because I have way, way too much stuff. Annie wants to know if any of us have any favorite retro or vintage clothing brands that we look for. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how old, how vintage it is, but I really love selling anthropology. 
some of their older stuff. And there's a brand now. I don't know if they're vintage, but they make vintage looking clothes. That's really profitable. They're called Oliphant, O-L-I-P-H-A-N-T. But their skirts, like I've sold their skirts for over $100 that I thrifted for like $2. I mean, it's just like crazy things like that with that brand. Um, and then some of the old, um, I've sold Coldwater Creek. They don't exist here anymore you know, the, the stores. So older women would buy from, uh, buy that from us. And then there's, um, Oh, uh, some of the people who are into Y2K, they really like stuff that says wet seal. Do you remember that Charlotte Russe oh, and wet yeah. seal? It doesn't sell highly yeah. profitable, but they do sell. So that's about as, you know, that's about the only band, band, brands that I can think of. Um, super vintage. I don't know. Or just anything that looks good. If they're sixties, fifties, I'll buy them. I don't know the brands. Yeah, I don't I don't deal in vintage clothing except for I have if I'm at a house on like a house call or something or even a state sale and it's empty enough, I do look for music or rock band t-shirts, concert t-shirts, but I'm looking for right. something with a little bit of age. I'm trying to avoid any of those like kind of like Walmart reissues from the you know 2005 era or 2010 era. But even like the stuff that I was buying in high school now, like the giant brand t-shirts i think they're called that were sold like a hot talk hot topic in the mid 90s are popular on ebay so matt if you have any seems completely not vintage yeah that can't matt, possibly be old if you have any vintage metallica adams in the market he's looking for <laughs> i sold i sold all my hot topic metallica t-shirts like right in the beginning Woo! of the pandemic awesome ride the lightning kill them all i had them all ride the lightning <laughs> Well, I'm I'm embarrassed to say I probably still have a Metallica T-shirt from going to the concert. So if I can find it, I'll send it to you. Um, <laughs> That's awesome, George. That's not embarrassing at all. <laughs> but as far as um, as far as a really good vintage name, uh, like I said, I like coats and accessories. Look for Lily Ann. That is a really good vintage coat name that people will pick up and it's good money. And if it's in good condition and they made other things too, I think they made suits and stuff, uh, but that is definitely a name worth looking for that you'll see in like 1960s, 70s era closets. Yeah. So for me, I'm more into like the nightgowns. So like Vanity Fair, I pick up, um, I what else did I just get? I can't even remember. I have a research video on vintage nightgowns, so I go more for the nightgown stuff. But I'm trying again. I'm trying to learn this stuff too, because I think I'm probably missing a lot. And I had tons of ACDC, Guns and Roses, Metallic. Man, if I had all my shirts from back then, I would make a pretty penny on them right now. Because for like, us. yeah, like right, yeah, like I would. But I I don't and and I I found a new kids on the block towel that sold for crazy I had a ton of that stuff too, so awesome. yeah I was definitely like Metallica guns and and it was all faded the ones that still sell really high faded holes because I wore the things so much that they were gray they were no longer black and yeah so I had that stuff too. Rocks to be me wants to know, George, do you offer for a fee online identification for weird antiques like you like they see you do on videos when you do your appraisal fairs or do you do anything via Zoom or FaceTime? And if you don't, can you recommend someone to them? I do. And I'm happy to have you send an email and I will be completely truthful and honest. I'm really backed up. Um, but I will try. Uh, that's the best I can promise right now. I, I have a lot of people who request that. I used to put it out as a service and immediately I was so far behind and I just wasn't getting to it all. And um, so it's kind of on a as people contact me basis and I'm still having trouble getting to it all. So for those of you who are still waiting for me, I apologize. And I'm hoping that I'm going to have some uh, downtime in the middle of this month to catch up. But uh, yeah, you can send an email to the antique nomad at Gmail and I will try. It is on a fee basis and I'll let you know what that consists of um, uh, before we go forward. So. And you normally post when you're doing like the in-person appraisals, right? And let everybody know where you'll be. 
Yeah, and that's really the honestly the uh, better way to do it in terms of it's inexpensive. So if I'm in your area, it's usually done as a fundraiser, and you're paying like three or five dollars an item as opposed to paying um, you know by hourly fee divided by how many minutes we spend. Um, I am going to be doing appraisal fairs. Uh, my next batch are going to be up in the Northwest. I'll be doing in um, Seattle and the Spokane and North Idaho area in April. Perfect. Miss Mary sent a $10 super chat. Thank you guys so, so much. I greatly appreciate it. I haven't seen Miss Barbara here tonight, but as soon as I do this, she's going to come. So I'll, I'm going to give you the pillow fight. Last time I did that, look, Adam's going to do one live for you guys. Felt inspired there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll answer another question, and then I'll do a couple of giveaways for you guys tonight. I didn't do them last week. Chance wants to know, and I think we answered this, if Vintage gets put in the recommended specifics instead of title, it's still searchable. I think we talked about that earlier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. <laughs> All right, Don wants to know, what is your strategy for pricing and running sales on eBay? So um, I just, I have this rule that I will Google Lens. I will look at what sold, when it sold, and then I like to be competitive. So I will price my items just like five or $10, whatever less than what another person is selling it for in hopes that mine would sell. Um, I don't run sales on eBay. I run sales on my website where I do free shipping. And um, occasionally if there's like, you know, holiday, I'll do 20% off things like that on eBay. I don't, I don't run sales. You mean like discounted sales, that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. I think that's what she means. Yeah. So uh, majority of my objects are, like I said, semi one of a kind. And I just price them on eBay for what I think they're worth. But if I, I do sell stuff like comic books or baseball cards that have you can look up like completed auctions and see what they're bringing. I for those I, I typically try to price them cheaper than any other buy it now, but probably a touch higher than what the the recent auctions have brought. You know, if, if for instance, like you see this with sports cards a lot, like the auctions might be consistently 50 to 60. The cheapest buy it now is 90. My buy it now might be somewhere like 65 or 70. Yeah, I like that strategy. I do a lot on auction, and I know that's not fashionable or popular, but because I've got a social media following, I actually usually come out pretty well on auction. And then I'll set the buy it now at kind of the low end of the current selling range, if I can find a current selling range. But if I have something that I don't see a sale uh, that has sold recently, or there's just nothing else listed, I usually won't put a buy it now. I'll just let the market tell me what it's worth. And that generally has been a pretty good strategy. And I have to say, I was inspired in part by um, when Crazy Lamp Lady got started and she would just put everything out at $4 and let the market tell her where it went. And I've got to say that really, um, you know, that makes some sense to me. I've been around uh, Burner Brothers auctions in Ohio and they start everything at like a dollar. It could be worth $10,000 and they'll start it at a dollar because they're confident that they will find where the market is for the piece uh, because if it's something really good people are going to find it and they're going to put it up to the number that it should be and it usually works and sometimes it works better like i'll put something on and think well maybe it'll go for a hundred bucks and it pops for two or 250 i wouldn't have known to put that number on it so you know we all have our different strategies but i don't really do sales because i don't list that way so George and I talked about this years ago. I think it was probably three years ago. And George probably remembers. We were at the antique mall and we were looking and people had 50% off signs. And you look and they mark the stuff up and they put it on sale. And really it was what it was. And I said, I hate when people do that. And I, I am those people. And I still do that. Um, so I price everything <laughs> up by 35% and I run a constant 35% off sale for it to end up where I want it to be priced. And it has been working for so long, I am scared to change that method. Um, I will not lie. And even though I hate, I hate when other people do that at like the thrift malls, 
Um, but I really think on eBay, I don't think most people pay attention to that. They just look at what like that ending number that I'm asking is anyways. Um, so I price up 35%, mark it down 35. So it ends up exactly where I want it. And then I have room at least 10% for offers, even the first day it's listed because I send offers to all watchers. And then, um, I, I typically though have quite a bit more room because I buy in lots and I buy on auctions. So I buy pretty cheap and yeah, so I am that guy that marks it up and prices it down and I'm the guy I hate. Um, yeah. <laughs> But I, I said I was going to change it and I'm so scared to change it. And I would have to change the price of 7,000 and I could bulk change it, but like the calculation in reverse isn't the same. So I would end up like, I would like screw myself all up at this point. And again, you know, it's all just different strategies. If I had that many listings to chase after, I would certainly consider that a viable way to do it. So there's really not a wrong answer. It just depends on the volume you're doing, the types of things. Um, you know, I'm I'm more like uh, like he said about I have more distinct individual items, so it, that wouldn't really work for me. But I'm not trying to list thousands of items either because I sell in the real world and I do a lot of volume there. So, you know, it just yeah. depends on how you do this. Yeah, but yeah and I mean, that's what it is, is marketing because people like sales, right? Like your typical yeah. consumer well, it likes sales. So that's the thought behind that. All right. Two super chats really quick. And then we're going to do a couple of giveaways and we'll answer questions while we're doing those. Rocks to be me said, thank you. I've been waiting for George to come to Houston or Galveston. Hint, hint. And then <laughs> Mark has finally showed up late as usual and sent his $5 late fee. And he said, finally, Rod is gone. So we can talk about him behind his back. So because Mark said that I'm going to give Mark Rod, even though Rod is not here. So you get Rod. Here you go. Thank you guys for watching. Please make sure you like and subscribe until next time. And, and again, he, I think it's his anniversary. I'm, I, I'm pretty sure. I don't want to say it wrong. I think it's his anniversary. All right. We're going to do a giveaway and luckily they messaged me and reminded me because my head is absolutely all over the place. So hashtag my reseller genie. We're going to give away a free month. If you guys don't know, they integrate with eBay. They integrate with Poshmark and it is an accounting software for resellers. The most expensive uh, monthly fee is 20 bucks. So it's actually very fairly priced compared to the 350 a month I pay my accountant. Um, and so if you're a smaller or mid-sized reseller, my reseller genie is a really great option. They were on the show with us a few months ago. If you guys want to search and they answered quite a bit of questions about the software and how it works as well. And I've met them in person at events and they are very, very nice people they are absolutely amazing and they are starting from reseller and accountant that's where this program came from is a married couple with a reseller and accountant so perfect perfect match for it all right naked thrifter wants to know if any of us buy at estate sales and what do you think is the best website for finding sales um there's estate sales.net i go on craigslist locally and i look there or um if you're really active on Instagram and you follow a bunch of uh, markets in your neighborhood, it'll just pop up. So a lot of times I just find it by accident. Next door is an option. Next also. door. Uh, but estate sales.net, I think we use it most. Yeah, estate sales.net is the only one I really use. And um, Facebook Marketplace, sometimes if you're just scrolling through there, you'll see posts. I think the only thing I can add to that is I know some people who are doing well finding them on Facebook Marketplace because some of the people who list on Facebook are older people who don't really know how to do anything beyond that. And I've been noticing that uh, sometimes there's some real deals with all of that. So um, that might be another place to look for them as well. Yeah, I use estatesales.net as well. You can have it email you sales in your area. That's what I do. That's how I found the dollar estate sale. So if you missed it on catch treasure hunting this week, a dollar. I went to an estate sale. Everything was a dollar. 
I have never seen that in my life. And it was absolutely insane. I spent $80. I'll give it away. Um, but yeah, it absolutely crazy. Oh yeah. If you do have a newspaper, our newspaper here locally, they, they stop printing. I know a few places still do. I am banned on Facebook marketplace. So I would have to make my husband look for me. Um, Cause I'm, I'm banned for life, but my, it was from vintage license plates three years ago and they oh. never would lift the restriction. Uh, like, Cause you can't you sell, you can't sell. My mom ignored the warnings that told her to stop listing them. She just kept listing cause we sell them on all the other platforms for decor, you know, vintage and antique license plates and Facebook marketplace does not allow them. Cause I guess people were selling real ones, you know, like, for stolen cars. I don't, I don't know, but that's why I got, I got banned. I agree. Facebook lives in stupid. I, I agree with that comment. <laughs> All right. Um, let's go ahead, pick a winner for this and then we'll give away Giaro pack. And I think Marsha put the link in. If you don't win, you can uh, save 10% with my code. If you want to try it for, or maybe it's 15. It might be 15. Colleen is the winner. Congratulations. So just, Email. I'm trying to think. Just email me and I'll figure out where for you to email them. The nurse flipper at yahoo.com. And then let's do two GRO packs. You guys can get whatever poly mailers, whatever color and size you want. If you win, we will give away two. They are back from their lovely three week vacation. I was very jealous of them. Um, all right. Annie wants to know if any of us sell vintage Tupperware. I do. Uh, specifically Tupperware, first of all, condition is really, really important. Smell is really, really important. And uh, specifically colors that are very MCM. So that olive green um, and the, the burned orange, those two colors are popular with us, when, especially vintage markets that are uh, live vintage markets. Smell. <laughs> it's really important. <laughs> I've, I've never sold that, but I'm, it's good to know to smell them first. <laughs> Do a sniff test. Yeah, that is a really good point. They can they can definitely deteriorate and not be too pleasant. Um, yeah, I look for the MCM colors too. There are chemicals in the old stuff. It's true that maybe you don't want to necessarily use the stuff, but a lot of people like it to look at. And I mainly seem to sell it in Florida because originally it was made in Orlando and there seemed to be a lot of collectors down there. So uh, it's funny to me to think of something like that. But, you know, it was actually pretty expensive when it was new. They'd have those home parties. And yeah, you yeah. Know, you shelled out some money for that stuff. One they still sell it, and it's still, like, super expensive. I don't know how I, like, came across, like, a new pamphlet. There's still, like, Tupperware sellers out there, um, and it's still very expensive. I sell it, too. I actually, at that dollar estate sale I just told you about, I picked up, like, five pieces of vintage Tupperware there for a dollar. Um, I like finding the big mixing bowls or like my mom always used it for flour when she was like flouring things like the green bowl. Um, so I would use that. Um, and the salt and pepper shakers do very well. Those are worth quite a bit too. So I, I will pick it up if I find it cheap. Um, yeah. And just the lids, I've sold lids for like 20 bucks, just a lid. It's kind of crazy because people will lose the lids or they get ruined. I found right. one that smelled like oh, marijuana go ahead. the other day, so. You found one what? That smelled like straight up marijuana, like they were stashing marijuana or something in the 70s. It was their marijuana bowl. Yeah. My mom put flour, or somebody else's mom put pot. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Monica's cool. saying eBay forced her, on that note, Adam's hiding. Um, eBay <laughs> forced her to add shipping policies. Now she says she can't see the shipping costs. So for bigger items, she likes to choose the cheapest rate. So she's asking if anyone else, and we'll ask on the panel and in the chat if anyone else is having this issue. I don't, I don't know, Kat. I, I've never had um, them force me to add shipping policies. I mean, I, I mean, you have to pick one, right? Like free shipping. Maybe I don't understand the question too much. No, there's a way to set policies. I'm oh. scared to even look at it because I've heard horror stories. So I don't click anywhere near shipping policies. 
Oh, um, oh. But it's where like if something's X weight to X weight, it costs this much. And like I, I do all calculated. So. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, I do. It says I like to choose the cheapest rate for the buyer. Ground advantage, right? But it won't. If you have a policy, I don't think it'll oh. let you. Oh, you know what? I would have to go in. But ground check. advantage is probably the cheapest in most yeah. cases. Y'all better watch out. Jesus is in the chat. <laughs> lucky Jesus has won multiple times, guys. He is really lucky and he wins the giveaways <laughs> and he is here. George, have you come across this or Matt, either one of you with the policies? Uh, Matt, uh, you answer first. I just use... um. I just do the calculated shipping and I pick, you know, whatever ones I'm willing to do. Um, sometimes I, I don't do uh, FedEx because the drop off is too far from where I'm at. Um, usually UPS store is pretty close or something, but um, yeah, I just use calculated shipping. So I've never, I don't have the shipping policies. Yeah, I'm a little puzzled by the fact that the that Monica's saying that eBay forced her to do it because um, uh, when I do listings, it it makes me check calculated shipping, and then it just is whatever it is. So, so somebody, Mar uh, Monica said that her shipping was gone, and it said add shipping policies. It's the only way she could add shipping was to make the policies, and then. Ren is saying shipping policies, you can have calculated and it lets the customer choose which one they use. I'm not familiar enough to be able to answer because I was so scared <laughs> a long time ago that I just stay away from them and just do the calculated. But yeah, yeah. I do calculate right, USPS. Let's pick two, two winners, two winners. Here we go. Dun, 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 dun. And what you do if you win this, you go to Giaro Pack and Pick the color and size, and then you email me with what color and size, and you're, Scott, don't tell me to draw again, buddy. You're taking the free poly mailers. You entered. Okay, let's pick another winner. Last time he told me to give away again. I'm not. You're going to take them and like them. Take the flower one. Dun, 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 dun. Faith lifts here. You got the second one. Let's watch. Scott will tell me. See, ha ha. See, I knew he enters and then he says he doesn't. Buddy, you're lucky. You're going to take them and then you can give them away. That's what's going to happen. All right. Michelle said she had a customer leave a one star rating on Poshmark. She wanted to return the item, but waited until three days had passed. So if you guys do not know on Poshmark, after three days, they are Mercari is the same. They are not allowed to return it. It's not like eBay. They don't have 30 days. After three days, they can't return it. So because it was past that, the customer couldn't return it. She's asking if there's any way to refund the customer. Does anybody else sell on Poshmark on the panel? Really rarely. So I'm not the best person to... I will start soon because I'm doing clothes and stuff. So I'm going to have a lot to learn. So I am not the best person to answer that. Yeah, I don't think any of us do. Do you still uh, cat? I do. Yeah. So I will tell you after that, I'm not going to give her a refund. And on Poshmark, there's no way for her to amend that one star review. So there's no way you would see me giving her a refund because she already rated me. Um, I had somebody on Mercari do the same thing. And I actually, I was nice. You guys would be very proud of me. Um, <laughs> She, it was lace and the girls calculated it wrong, the length of the lace. And I said, it's after three days, Mercari won't allow you to refund it. I would have been happy to accept it back. And she said, well, since you're willing to accept it back, will you buy it for me at the same price I bought it from you? I said, yes, that's fine. She listed it. I bought it and she got her money back because that was, that was our, that was our fault. We mismeasured, but it was her fault that she waited past that three day window. Um, but in that case, she didn't leave me a negative review. She was nice. She messaged me. I agreed with her. It was my fault. And I did it. Um, yeah, so if they've not given me, um, Summer Fudge is saying, can't you give them a goodwill gesture? So there's no way on Poshmark to refund it. 
But for me, my willingness to give them a goodwill gesture would go out the window with a one star rating because they didn't give me the opportunity to fix it before exactly. they negatively impacted my business. Um, so, <clears throat> um, yeah, so they're saying it didn't fit, but it was listed as men's shorts in a situation like if, if they do it in the three days and you had it listed properly and it was a customer's mistake, that's what I love about Poshmark. They will not let that customer return it. That was their bad for reading wrong. Now, if it was a child's item and you said it was men's, then Poshmark will force that refund. Um, but for me, uh, if they like, if you leave me negative feedback and then you want me to be nice to you, it, it's probably not going to happen. Just an FYI for anybody. <laughs> Cause you can't take that back. Like I think yeah. everybody should give a seller the chance yeah. to, <clears throat> my voice is going, um, to make a situation. Right. I want to tell you guys, I want to, I want to know in the chat because I'm really on the fence about leaving someone a negative feedback. So I'm gonna tell you guys what happened. I drop shipped something because I couldn't find it. Uh, candle holder, I paid for it. They messaged me, said, hey, we're out of town. We'll ship it on Monday. I said, okay. And <clears throat> a week and a half later, they messaged me and said, sorry, we forgot to ship it. We're gonna ship it now. A week and a half later, we are now at four weeks past when I paid. I I messaged them and said, hey, are you planning on shipping this? Can you please let, and luckily my customer just was oblivious and hasn't even asked where it's at. So I got lucky, but um, I messaged, they did not answer me for over a week until I opened a claim of item not received. Still did not, they shipped it when I opened the case, but still did not communicate with me would you leave that seller a negative feedback over a month to ship the item with no communication? Sam, what say you as another seller? No. You would not leave them negative feedback? Oh yeah. I mean, I'm like kind of like weird about leaving any feedback because of karma. So like any bad feedback. So I was just going to say, I ordered from my favorite Chinese restaurant <laughs> last night and either last night or the night before, and they forgot my egg roll. And like, this is my favorite place. So I didn't, I didn't leave them a negative review. I didn't even, <laughs> I'd only give them five stars all the time. I didn't even give them four stars. I just didn't leave a review. So, we believe in karma. Yeah. I'm just like weird about negatively impacting anyone's business, even if they don't mean well, you know, or, or something, you know, we just, it has to be really bad for me to leave a bad review. Like that stay. We, were <laughs> we had a bad experience at our Airbnb and Mount Dora. It was horrible. I, I mean, Matt, what would you do? I don't want to ruin her life. Oh man. Uh, that's, that's tricky. I, I might be tempted. I, I would I, I, I would be I at least on the fence. If it was like a much worse thing, I'd have no problem leaving negative feedback. And if it was like, you know, not as bad thing, I probably wouldn't leave any feedback. But that that's getting into that area where it's kind of could go either way. I guess it would depend on how everything else in my life was going at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's very true i to me i would make sure they do it and get it to your customer and then decide what to do um, it's been delivered it was delivered yesterday uh yeah well i think maybe maybe neutral feedback with a negative honest, comment <laughs> with an honest explanation <laughs> and comment would be one way of doing it yeah, I, I was thinking that too. Mark says, leave it alone. I'm going to put some comments up here. Uh, Mary said she would leave it a negative because it does give us a bad name, right? Like it took them a month to sell. They didn't communicate with me. And the funny thing is their name is, I'm not going to tell you the whole name, but it's multitasking something. And I'm thinking you're multitasking a little too much if you miss shipping a sale for a month. And that's almost what I want to tell them because that's their username on eBay um, <laughs> saying I would less lose. And I'm thinking that too. And I'm thinking leave a neutral and maybe really message them and tell them exactly what I think is another seller um, might be the way to go. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, do, do it directly because it's between you two, really. But I would like to leave a neutral because I would hate for that to happen to another buyer without something. And they they do, and this is a lot of it, they, they have 100% feedback right now. They have no negatives. It would be their first one. Um, and you know how, like, I know when my, now I don't care. I'm like, whatever, because I don't have my 100. I'm like, just leave all the negatives you want. Um, and like Colette saying, I think negative is, I agree. Like what repercussion is there for them? There, like there, there's not much. That's why I think maybe <clears throat> my, well, my feet, uh, you don't want my personality to reflect on the feedback. They would not like me very much. Um, it's hard as another seller, right? Like, because you know how much it affects somebody. I do. And it, they don't have a lot. I, I think neutral and I'll message them. I mean, it's binging them on the algorithm, though, that it took them a month, right? So. Oh, the gotta, shipping. Yeah. Mark is right. Like, I don't know what they were having issues with, but they didn't communicate with me. That's the thing. And they had other positive feedback. And I think they literally just forgot to ship my item. Like, and we're shipping other stuff. So it sounds like there were, there was way too much going on. Um, I don't know if they gave me feedback yet, but I'm the buyer, so they can't leave me negative feedback, <laughs> um, which is the nice thing. So, all right, enough about that. Thank you guys for your opinions. I'll probably do neutral is probably what I'll do and message them and let them know as another seller, they could have minimally communicated with me more than once every two weeks like they did. That's fair. Yeah. All right. Miss Udal Ali says, I've been trying to finish setting up my knickknacks account and it keeps saying photos of my ID are blurry. I didn't, did we have to give an ID for knickknacks? I didn't. And I George, didn't. do you, are you on knickknacks? No, I'm not. And uh, Jocelyn's editing her uh, video in the other room, or else I would ask her directly. But I think, Jocelyn. I think, I think you do. I think, or at least I think, new sellers maybe have to. Um, okay. You know, it's. Gosh, I, I don't know exactly what the answer is. My about. phone has like a scan option um, for documents and I've used that for my ID, but I don't use an iPhone, so I'm not a good. Yeah. Person. Maybe, maybe taking it to a copy center and scanning it is the thing to do or something instead. Um, if, if the yeah. iPhone is working, I'm not really sure why that would be happening. Uh, why it wouldn't be focusing. It might be, you know, sometimes the, now with these enhanced driver's licenses, sometimes they're three dimensional. So maybe it's just not able to capture a good image. Yeah. Maybe use someone else's phone and see how it does. Yeah, uh, that's a good idea too. Just our make Florida sure license. Make Sorry. sure there's enough light. Yeah, make sure it's bright. Yeah, I think room. our Florida license has like an iridescence to it. So maybe- It has like that 3D thing. Yeah. Maybe you just have to kind of like move the idea around until you get it. <laughs> um, Annie said on eBay, as a seller, are you required to ship the item if the seller has not been paid yet? I want to clarify what I think she means. I think she's saying her buyer has paid, but she's not yet received the funds for the item. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, I ship it because I'm going to leave it. <laughs> up to eBay to, I trust eBay to give me my funds when, you know, um, when appropriate or <laughs> when they're, you're going to get your funds, right? I, I've never, yeah, I've never had an issue, yeah. you know, they'll give it to you, but yeah, you're required to, you have to ship it at a, you know, whatever time that you said you would ship it one to three days. Um, you'll get your funds. I think, isn't it worse on Mercari? Isn't that all? Isn't Mercari's system like just so no, no? Because after three days you get your money, <laughs> and they can't return the friggin' thing. Like the money's yeah. yours. It's not like eBay where they can say item not described in twenty nine days after they wore it mm -hmm. for a month. Yeah. Matt. Oh, I would say I, I mean I ship it as, as soon as I can. I I have three days three-day handling um I'm, i don't do the one-day handling 
And I, I you, probably 95% of them were one day, but yeah, I ship it before I get paid. I will mm-hmm. say if you're like a new seller or if you let your account go dormant for a while, they do apparently hold the funds longer, which probably- Yeah, for like two to weeks to a month. Yeah. So you, so that, that would be annoying, but you still have to ship it. Yeah, yeah. I ran into a situation over the holidays where I sold more than I'd ever sold on eBay before. And all of a sudden there was a limit to how much they would pay out. Um, and, uh, I ran into that with PayPal actually, and it was, it was fine. I mean, it just, I just had to wait a little bit, but I, you can't hold up the shipping because of that. The, the customer is not their fault. Yeah, I agree. As soon as they make sure they have paid eBay and you see payment received, but if you wait till the funds are available to you, you will get dinged because you might have one day or three day handling and you might not get the funds for like, like Matt was saying, like they can hold them for two to four weeks if you're new or like George is saying he sold more than he did. And that way you would get, you would get dinged and could get your account into like a negative status by not shipping and it sucks, but the funds are there. You will get them. It just might take time if you're new. Yeah. And, and, and after, after a little while, I was actually able to ask for an increase in the amount that I could sell before that would be a stop. You know, they just, they thought it was unusual because, uh, you know, suddenly I'm selling five figures and I don't usually put enough on to hit that kind of a level. So, yeah, I think it probably flags, you know, flags something in the system. Like maybe, you know, like where they think like, oh, this could be fraud because this guy's all of a sudden selling all this stuff Mm -hmm. and he doesn't normally. So. All right. Have you ever sent offers to watchers and you receive an insulting counter offer less than half of what your offer was? And how did you handle that? All the time. And I just ignore it. (laughs) It happens all the time. Um, I literally just ignore it. Um, Move on. I don't even mess around with people who really lowball me. You, you can, when you send an offer, though, you can block counter offers. So you can also do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I If I say anything, which I usually don't, I tell people the same thing that I uh, uh, tell them at real world shows. And when they make a half price offer, I say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not going out of business. So I don't need to sell it. <laughs> no. I should steal that, George. That's I think good. you That's use good. that. I love George. I love that. Um, I do what Matt said. I do not have counter offers allowed. When I send them an offer, I typically am sending them my bottom that I'm willing to take at that time. Um, it's just a button flipping cute. On the, when you send offers, it says either allow counter offers or you can uncheck the box, which is what I do because I do it. I. I like what George said. I'm going to have to steal it. I typically, if they send me 50% or less, say I am more than happy to negotiate when you send me a reasonable offer and I don't find half off or less than half off to be reasonable. That's what I send with my decline. <clears throat> but I like that I'm not going out of business thing a little better. Um, In person, I right. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's no okay. I, I, like I have a bowl, like a porcelain Camilo from Poland that I'm sure George, you know, this bowl is like, it's worth like over a thousand dollars and somebody just shot me and I have it up for like six ninety eight, and somebody sent, I, there was a watcher and I offered five fifty, which is really reasonable. It's brand new, almost looks brand new. And he came back with 50 and I wrote back, I was like, did you mean 500? And he said, no, 50. <laughs> and I just ignored it. I was like, wow, no way, you know? So So that's another, it depends on my mood kind of thing. I know some people were saying that. Oh, see, Scott is nice. Scott says, thank you for the offer. Unfortunately, I think we're too far apart in price for me to negotiate. Thank you again. Basically, we're all telling them to go jump off a cliff in different ways. Um, I... It depends on my mood. If it's half off or less, I will tell you I have been stopping more 
to look at the item. And if I bought it and it's been listed for years and I bought it for a low price, I will accept some of those 50%. Mm -hmm. um, I have to stop and think business wise. Like if it was priced 300, I paid 20 bucks. They're offering me 150. It's been listed two years. I will take some. So I have to make myself be like, wait, like take a step back. Uh, so I, instead of counter offering the original, pro I will, so that's where I was kind of getting to, depending on my mood, I will either decline or I will counter them with a penny under my asking price. And that's when I put the message that I'm happy to negotiate with reasonable offers. And I did not find theirs to be reasonable. Um, I mean, we, we, could, we could send them laughing emojis, but... I, it, it depends on, if I'm in a good mood, I just decline it and move on. If I'm being a little grumpy, that's when I counter with a penny less than my asking price. Does anybody know if Bell Bottoms are making comeback? Yeah, absolutely. Y2K, absolutely coming back with the Daisy pattern uh, platform shoes. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just like my sleepy pants. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bless your heart, the, the Southern answer, uh, the Southern way of telling them. Uh, Bless your heart. <laughs> we should make like all of these and just alternate what you decline the feedback with. We'll have messages for them. Um, what is each of our opinions about going to the first expensive day of an estate sale versus the second or third day? I find something every time I don't, of course, if you want first dibs, you got to be there before they open wait in line on Saturdays. Usually that's the best, but I don't have the time all the time. So I will still check out an estate sale on Sunday. And I, I, I always find something. I realize that I find things that other people are not necessarily looking for. So um, it's the same thing when you're thrifting with other resellers around. I don't worry about that. I'll find something, you know. Um, the first expensive day. I mean, are there first expensive days? Usually they're pretty consistent. It depends on what you buy, right? Um, it depends on what they're selling things for. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't have the same experience. Like, I don't feel like when I go to an estate sale, there's like an expensive day, if you know what I mean. Like, it's just consistent. The next day, there might be less things, you know? I don't know if I answered that right. <laughs> I, I think what they're referring to is that a lot of estate sales, like the second day is 25% off the price. Oh, not here. The third day is 50%. Here off it is. Oh, I am not in my <coughs> <laughs> I haven't seen that. Like you can negotiate, but I, I haven't seen, right? Like we just went to one recently and they didn't have anything like half off or anything. They just had a second day. So maybe I didn't know that. I don't go to a lot of estate sales, though. It's mostly garage sales, thrift stores. So I probably didn't know that. Yeah, I've, I found stuff the first day. I found stuff the third day. Typically, I like I like to go the first day. I don't do a lot of estate sales. It depends on where I'm currently living. For a long time, I lived in southern Delaware, and the estate sales weren't very fruitful there. But I spent a lot of time in New York State the last year, and I had some really good luck at estate sales. But sometimes I got there like an hour late. And what I wanted was still there. So I didn't yeah. have to stand in line and fight the crowd. Yeah, I, I both attend and conduct estate sales. And I can tell you from both sides of it. Now, I realize some people are saying in certain markets that the estate sales are pricing things at retail the first day. And that may be what this person is uh, referring to. But even then, stuff slips through. And I know from pricing and doing estate sales, sometimes we miss stuff or there's so much stuff, we just can't get to all of it. And so bargains do go out. Um, but I just did a video on Monday. It's interesting. This came up where I went to an estate sale in Tampa and I went the first day and I spent about $150 and was happy with what I got. And then I scouted it and thought, I'm going to come back on, it was a three day sale. I'm going to come back on the third day, which is going to be their discount day. And if this and this and this and this are here at half price, I will buy them. And I spent $500 on half off days. So I, if you have the time, I like to do both because you will find stuff on both ends of the sale. So that's, that's my strategy. Yeah. So Scott saying the same thing George said, like 
estate sale professionals do not know everything. And George, George did an estate sale and I went when it was half off. But a lot of what I got, like the George, I don't know if you remember, like all the Nexium pins and like George had them at like 50 cent or a dollar. And I like, I sold a Nexium bottle for 50 bucks. Mm -hmm. um, so I got a lot of pharmaceutical stuff. I will go on all three. Like I, it's more about convenience for me than like the sale because most of them are so far from me. I have to pick one day that I'm going. I like being an everything seller because I can always find something. I don't care if I'm the last person in the door. I'm going to find something. Here, they've been starting the estate sales on Wednesdays and Thursdays, which is great if you're a full-time reseller, which sucks for Sam. It might be better <clears throat> Saturday when she gets there. It's going to be 50. Sometimes Saturdays are the last day here, and it's 75% off. Um but I like to go on Wednesday and Thursday because a lot of people are working and I can go and get there and get more stuff. But again, I also like being the last person in because they'll make more deals with you. You can buy bundles, lot stuff up at the dollar estate sale. I went to, I, they had boxes of linens and I would have just taken them all. And I asked them if I could get a deal, but it was the first day. And so they said no. And I don't argue with that. You know, I totally understand. But I was so far away. I told him, like, I can't come back. Like, I appreciate it. But I'm just, you know, I can't come back. And yeah, yeah, that was a great sale George had there. And I think a lot of you would have walked in and been like, oh, there's nothing here. <clears throat> but I left with a whole, like, I don't think we could fit more in my car. Oh, no. um, it was like, <laughs> completely packed um, from Georgia's estate sales. So you can pick the best on the first day, but you're going to get the best prices. So it depends on what your buying strategy really is. Marsha wants to know, George, when will you be back in Mount Dora? Oh, Mount Dora is done for the season. So um Usually I go back in November, but this November, I think I'm going to be out of town on vacation. So it might be next January before I go back. Um, the big extravaganzas are only three times a year and it's November, January and February. Uh, then their big extravaganzas are up in Cutstown, Pennsylvania, where they have their uh, other operations. So uh, maybe you'll see me at uh, Renegers up there. Yeah, and I went to that one when I was up there visiting Jocelyn and didn't know we had the one down here until I went to Georgia's. Mary wants to know if all of us have websites in addition to our selling platform. I do. I have jollyflipsvintage.com. I'm really trying to market myself uh, through our website more uh, just to avoid fees and really... Our, our website is so clean, you know, it's like things are right there. You don't have to dig um, too much. And then there's a blog portion down at the bottom. So I am trying really hard to get the Google, the Google search to go there. You have to pay for that. I pay $300 a month uh, for Google ads to get traffic on my website. That's very challenging. And I don't think a lot of people know that when they're going into the business um, that's why they sell so much on uh, platforms, other platforms, but I really don't like the fees. I'll do it, but I would prefer, uh, and I tell people that on my YouTube, I would prefer that you come directly to our website and you could even message us if there's a, something like a price that you don't like, I would, you know, negotiate that way instead of doing the offer thing on eBay. You know what I mean? It'd be better for you to come directly to me. So yeah, we have a website. Yeah, one of the ways I sell a lot of stuff, not just through my website, but I do an email, um, like email once a month or so. And that really came to fruition, I don't know, a couple of years ago when Facebook and Instagram was were down for like a whole day. And at the time, I was relying a lot on Facebook groups to sell stuff and Instagram. And so I was like, I need to control. I want to control you know, some part of my business and, you know, with eBay, with whatever we're using, eBay, Etsy, any of those things, you know, you're paying a fee, but you're not, you never know when that fee is going to go up. And if you're selling on the social media, you never know when they're going to crash or when that social media is going to become less popular. So it's nice to have your own, your own thing where that you, 
you can control. But it takes a long time to drive traffic there organically. Very expensive too, depending on um, what you use. I use Wix. That's ours. I was using, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with leftcoastrevivals.com. She's one of my favorite sellers and vintage. It's Laura Caldwell. I was going to use hers. What is the one she uses? Something space. But they're, they're just about a little more expensive, I think, than Wix. So I went with Wix, but it's both of those platforms are really great, but they're expensive. You're paying a lot to start when you first start with your business to have a website and drive traffic. Yeah. But. Yeah, definitely true. I have a website, but honestly, I don't uh, do a lot of product listing. Uh, mine is hosted by Weebly, which is now part of Square. Um, so the payments and stuff are all integrated. Uh, I primarily just sell my uh, book, uh, the book I wrote on treasure craft and pottery craft through it. I, it is set up for me to do a store and I've done that once or twice where I put things on and I intend to do more of that, but I intend to do lots of things that I may or may not ever get to because life is just full of opportunity. <laughs> yeah. And I have my website. <clears throat> my voice is about done for the night. Um, but I don't sell from it. I'm kind of the opposite of them. I would rather pay the fees to eBay <laughs> than like pay $300 a month like Sam's doing to hope for traffic. Because <clears throat> it's not guaranteed. On eBay, I have millions of users that are there. And I, you know, I'm paying them a fee for that. So I think you guys should realize like listening to them say, to get that traffic, you have to pay, you have to spend time. And that's why we're paying fees to these selling sites is exactly because of that. Um, so I use mine more informational. I have like, it links to YouTube. Um, I, I could also like George, I could sell on there, but we just have such a quantity. Like Laura does once a month drops, like Matt was saying, he does his emails, you know, if you're doing like once a month, here's all this stuff, but ours is a continual business. There's 30 items at least getting listed every day. We do a lot of volume. So for us, it is better, I feel like, to use the platforms. However, for my thrifting channel, I do direct sales, like Sam was saying. And at the end of every video, I tell people, if you're interested in something, email me at the nurse flipper at yahoo.com and then i avoid those fees like i had somebody tonight emailed about something she made me an offer and i don't know if she's in the chat um and it was less than i wanted <clears throat> i told her what i would take and it was 25 dollars less than i had it on ebay plus free shipping if she bought it directly from me um and she ended up telling me hey i want it she sent me the offer on eBay and said, hey, I emailed you too. So I declined the offer, ended the listing, responded to her email and sent her an invoice because she found it through my video. So I did like, I'm not going to pay eBay fees when I'm directly already communicating. Um, but I'm like, mine, yeah, is basically marketing is what mine is um, to just get my name out. And if you're doing social media, you don't want somebody else to have your name, guys. You you want to have it whether you utilize it or not. You don't want somebody else to come and take it if your name's the same everywhere. Um, and so I do direct sales through that. Tiffany Thrifting Vegas, oh, almost all of her Tiffany. stuff yeah. is sold directly from her videos. So if you have the social media, you can do that. Um, and... I don't, I don't think a typical seller, unless you have the social media and the, you know, you're driving your own customers there, it's really hard, I guess is what I'm saying. <clears throat> I'm going to have a coughing fit. Okay, we have two more questions. Let's, Sam, are you, are you listing on Knickknacks yet? I have listings, but I guess I found out last night. I was like, how do you schedule a show? I only know how to go live. And um, the customer service told me that you have to do the onboarding. And I've just been, my dad had a transplant, a kidney transplant. So I've been out of the loop. So I, I guess I have to do onboarding to actually schedule live shows. So, yeah, yeah. But I have some listings up, like buy it now is right now. Yeah. Matt. I I, I am not selling on Nick. You're not. <clears throat> Why not? <laughs> 
<laughs> Jocelyn's in the background saying, why not? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, I, uh, uh, I have been invited. And again, it's one of those things where the world is full of wonderful opportunities and I just can't do it all. Um, but I definitely get the feeling that um, it's building up. And I think that there's, uh, I think there's a lot to be said, like we were talking about, do you want to try to develop your own thing and uh, develop a website and promote a website and spend the money on it and take the time? Uh, I think for a lot of smaller sellers, knickknacks and uh, these, these concepts are really great because you get the benefit of someone else's large audience and the fees are less than what you're paying on um, uh, eBay or some of those other places. So uh, definitely something that seems like a great idea to me. It's just, uh, it's just another thing that I haven't gotten oh, for me thing. <laughs> Yeah, so for me, I haven't been doing good listing things on there, so I haven't been getting sales, but when I do my live shows, they've been great. And I actually have a friend, um, and Jocelyn's listening, and my friend Jenny Kay, who sells jewelry and a lot of uh, collectibles, said she's second in place on knickknacks for selling, and she is going live on there all the time. So for me, I want to do more live sales on there. I think that would be the better route and I need to. Um, the answer to can you list on knickknacks without going live? Yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you can. You do have to be approved as a seller. Um, so it's knickknacks, N-I-K-N-A-X.net. If you guys want to apply, I don't know how backlog Jocelyn is on selling applications. It might take a little while. But I've done very well with the live sales that I've done there. Okay, when relisting an item on eBay, this is Miss Bridget, what is the difference in relist or sell similar? So I always pick sell similar. That's something I learned from Rod. Um, if you relist, I think when you sell similar, doesn't it like kind of help with the algorithm? It has been helping for me. And I, I, I learned that from Rod on your, on your podcast. So I've noticed a difference. When I relist something, it's like it doesn't get any traction. So I yeah. always do sell similar. Do do sell similar, but you also might want to change your photos, which can be a big pain if it's a cheap item. But if it's expensive enough, you, I was told you were supposed to change your photos because then the algorithm does think it's a, a And the title item. some. And yeah, that way they think <laughs> it's a similar item and not the same item. And then the algorithm would treat it more like a new item and so put it out. Yep, what you all said, absolutely. I think that's a much better strategy. Yeah, and I do sell similar as well because you get a new item number, but unfortunately I do like 100 at a time, so I don't have time to move the pictures around and change the titles, I just sell similar. But it has helped move some older items. Um, that definitely has helped me. All right, Kat, am I gonna do a camp again? Um, I don't know. Um, George, George was my co-speaker at my first camp that I did down in Orlando. If you guys that know, we had it at a mansion in Orlando. It was a 14 bedroom mansion. It was pretty cool. We did classes during the day and we all ate together. Um, it was a lot of work and I don't know. <laughs> um, that was also before uh, Dalton started school, which has put a whole new family dynamic on things. We could travel and do things more freely before he was in school where now we don't have as much free time. So yeah, Mark said Florida camp. Mark was there at the camp as well. Um, we did a Florida camp and we did a Tennessee camp in the mountains, maybe. And <clears throat> I've talked to Liz perfectly about maybe sponsoring it. So some of the weight of the planning and organizing would be off my shoulders because that was just so, so much for me. And I just took it head on like I do everything else, right? Like absolutely crazy. So uh, you say maybe a Zoom camp. I have classes on my big cartel. I hardly ever advertise them. I'm horrible about that. But I do have replays of live classes I've done that you can purchase on my big cartel. I am horrible about advertising for myself. <clears throat> the camp was in Pigeon Forge and that was a 12 bedroom 
cabin and Scott Chiching King was my co-speaker <laughs> at that one. Um, so I don't know. I, that, I, I went around. I, I don't know. Uh, possibly, but there is nothing in the plans right now. If I can convince Liz perfectly to coordinate it and do everything for me, very possibly. Um, <laughs> definitely not on the West Coast. I can tell you that 110%. If I do another one, it will probably be a Florida one just for convenience of me. I love Oregon. <laughs> I, I could have a camping <laughs> camp. You're right. I have six acres of pines. If you would like to set up tents, we could do like a hippie cat camp. <laughs> Don't don't okay. tell me to do it because I totally like I have I have the space here. I have the space. All right. I'm going to let everybody tell you guys bye. I appreciate everybody hanging out with us so long. So he, Sam, Adam, if you guys have shows or like Matt, if they can sign up for your email, let them know how. Um, so <coughs> it's almost gone. Here's Sam. Well, we are selling on whatnot quite a bit. We're, we're not very consistent on it, so we don't have a lot, like a big um, audience there. So we would love it if you could support us on whatnot. I do random shows. Um, we're heading over to Nashville this weekend for a conference for my nursing job, but I'm going to um, do some YouTube videos there. When we get back, we're doing a beach decor theme show. I think that's like the Tuesday, next Tuesday. So come and check us out. Check out our website. Check out our YouTube. Follow us. Comment. Like. Subscribe. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Kat. Come see us. We do You're the welcome. West Market the third Saturday of every month. We do it in Lake Park, Florida with the Kel Kelsey Vintage Goods. So if you're in South Florida, come and see us. We do the market there from 9 to 12 p.m. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Perfect. Here's Matt. All right. Well, uh, thank you for having me. This was actually really fun. I didn't know what to expect from this side of things, but it was actually uh, really fun to be on here. If you're on Instagram, I'm Matt Greg Antiques on Instagram. I'm most, I'm most active there. Um, and then it, my sign up on my website for my email. You can find it there or shoot me an email directly or shoot me a message through Instagram. But I guess the one thing I, I'm not signed up for any future shows right now, but my girlfriend who does like um, social media strategy for a lot of businesses and has done work for some major antique shows and stuff in, the, in this country, her and I are putting together a package about how to sell vintage and antiques on social media. And that should be out probably by the end of the month. But uh if you hit me up on Instagram, I'll be posting about it there. Oh, I'll right. find you on Instagram, Matt. <laughs> All right, here's George. Oh, that's great. I am uh, very excited we got to do this. And I got, uh, I'm actually between show season. I will be heading to um, uh, the Northwest next. I have appraisal fairs, three coming up, one in Seattle, uh, one in Spokane, and one in North, or actually both in North Idaho in the Spokane area. And I think I've got that on my community tab here on YouTube uh, to find a schedule. Also, I will be doing uh, the uh, show in Spokane, the April show, which I think is the third weekend of April. Uh, so you can catch me there. And then, of course, um, uh, regular uh, premieres on YouTube every Monday and Wednesday. So I will look forward to seeing you all one place or another. All right. I guys, I all I have is this cough. So I don't feel bad. I just can't <laughs> quit coughing and it won't go away. So I sound horrible, but I really I honestly I feel I feel fine. I just <laughs> can't quit coughing. Um I am doing a wholesale linen show tomorrow and whatnot. Uh I think at eleven AM. So bookmark that. I'm going to do them in lots instead of, <coughs> I swear, instead of individual. I did a podcast earlier with Good, Great, Fabulous, and the same thing happened at the end of her podcast. Um, next week, we are going to have Miss Taffy and Brandy, my reseller treasure. So that'll be a fun show. Thank you all for hanging out. George, thank you for filling in. Sam, Adam, Matt. Thank you guys so much, and we'll see you guys next week. Bye, guys. Bye.